A very good evening to you. Thanks for joining us on the Tuesday edition of the show. It's the first for the week, and it promises to be exciting. I'm Yemi Adebaya. On the show tonight, we'll talk about Toby Amushan as she continues our exploits ahead of the World Athletics Championship. Also, we'll spare a thought for Esse Brume as well on the show tonight. Uh, we'll take you through what's happening in the fast pace, money speeding, and always rewarding world of sports. We'll talk about football transfers. We'll look at what's happening on the domestic scene, uh, especially with uh, football in Nigeria. That's the outlook of the show for today. And of course, it's a two-man show. I'm not alone. Uh, my colleague, Austin Kohn Akpan, is with me as we take this ride together across the money spinning world of sports. Well, greetings to you, Yemi, and of course, everyone joining us from different parts of the world. Always an interesting, exciting world of sports. Fantastic season. Toby Lover Amushan has seemed to be having already. Uh, just last week, she gave us a meet record and then a season's best, and then she sustained that momentum uh, today in Hungary. Just a second uh, difference from what she ran in Poland. Fantastic form. That's consistency. I love it. We'll talk about it on the show tonight. We'll also talk about the 2026 Commonwealth Games in some sort of jeopardy as Australia said, look, we're pulling out the city of Victoria that they are not going to host it. So uh, that puts that condition in a state of some confusion. We'll find out how organizers will get out of that one. We'll also uh, take a look at para badminton. I love the story that they told when they represented Nigeria uh, in Kampala, Uganda. So beautiful one coming from Special Sports, and I'm pumped up to talk about everything tonight with you, Yemi, on the show. All right, that's very good. Um, I think I like the way I am, so I'll remain standing for a while. Let me quickly bring in our partner on the show tonight, Kende Idris. Been a while, but he joins us on the show. Uh, greetings to you, Kende. Uh, thanks for finding out time to be with us on the show tonight. Uh, it's good to be here, and it's good to, uh, you know, join you on the day where uh, one of the brightest things coming from Africa right now, Toby Loba uh continues our exploits. Uh, probably um, the noise hasn't been as much as it is in 2022, but I, Kane Idris, is um, not bothered about anything in 2023. I'm waiting for 2024 Paris, uh, you know, the Olympics, where I want to see Toby Loba Amusson tumble on, uh, you know, other compatriots in the hurdles and she sticks up a, a place in the rightful, uh, you know, place in the books of history. Yeah, I hope that happens uh, as well. All right, Austin has set the tone. So let's just go in that direction and talk about Obloba uh, Amosho and talk about uh, what she has done, what she has achieved. And a lot of people are hoping that this will continue. Uh, and of course, in Hungary uh, today, the other time it was Poland. Today is Hungary and just coming few weeks ahead of the World Athletics Championship, we're hoping that she will continue uh, and, uh, you know, maintain uh, what she's been doing uh, right there. And just, uh, just like we said, uh, she did this, continue with her form. She clocked 12.35 seconds in the women's uh, 100 meters hurdles, uh, barely two days after she won uh, in uh, Poland. And of course, she beat, you know, the people that uh, Kenny Idris was referring to, the rivals, she, she beat them. Uh, America's duo of Nia Ali, uh, and of course, she also beat uh, Lele Johnson. Uh, both came in second and third, respectively. Uh, all right, so uh, let, let me go to Austin quickly. Uh, he has 18 or two uh, to say, I mean, we're out of adjectives to describe Toby Loba. Uh, I'm just hoping that there won't be injuries, there won't be loss of form. If she stays like this, this is definitely uh, a medal prospect in Paris. Just look at, you know, just look at her face and, and see the hunger, see the passion. Uh, the way she is doing well. uh, Our opponents, week in, week out, tells you that it means serious business. This is just a memorial meet. It's in 13th edition of the Gold Eye is, is one our memorial meets, and she gave us 12.35 right there in Hungary. But let me just run through to be another emotional season this year at the Diamond Milk, at the Diamond League, you mean? At Stockholm, she ran 12.52, and we were saying, oh, she's not getting into it. I would, she said, calm down, I'm just getting started. And then she went to Luzern, and in Luzern, she ran 12.47. 
I said, that's more like the Toby that I know. And just last week, in Silesia, in Poland, he ran 12.34 seconds, a meeting record, and the season's best, 12.34. A week after that performance, she's giving us 12.35. All of the ladies running in that, uh, all, all those events with Toby Lover, they are tired of being beaten. Right from the World Championships last year in Oregon to the Commonwealth Games to the last Diamond Meet of 2022 to this season. That's consistency. And, I, and as I'm telling Idris mentioned, I hope that she keeps it going for Paris 2024. I love her determination. I love her passion. And when I spoke to her in Birmingham, she said, Look, I'm just going to take you one step at a time, one day at a time. And that's what she's doing. And it's just from the results I just read out, you can tell that race after race after race, Toby Loba is getting better. Yeah, I agree with you. But let me go to Kenny Deidre's. Um, my worry, uh, and I've told a few friends, is how as a nation, I, I don't want to say help her unpack her calendar because you see, put her in a situation where she doesn't have to go to an event unless it's necessary, yeah. you know, and so that she could, we could find a way where she could reserve our best when it matters most. We've seen some of our athletes beat their rivals, but when it matters most, yeah. they just fall short. And Toby's journey, you know, the icing would be for her to continue all of this, get to the Olympics and do it. It, it, it will be, it's her story. Yeah. If after doing all of this, you know, so what can be done to help as a nation, uh, you know, that, that cares about our athletes, what, what can be done to really stand solidly behind her and ensure that these performances keep coming and it keeps going through uh, to the Olympics? Support her um, is it, as simple as that. Whichever way support could be, probably she returns, uh, you know, to Nigeria. She gets a good facility to train. And then whatever she's doing abroad, she feels the support and love from home. That is somebody from, uh, you know, the Federation reaching out to her, meeting her in person, and then, you know, what can we do? Because to help. for everywhere she goes, Toby is, run, is not running for Toby Loba Musho. Yes, you mention her name, but just after that, or even before that, yeah, Nigeria's Toby Loba Amusha, or you hear Toby Loba Amusha from Nigeria, there is always a name attached to the nation, or the nation, you know, attached to her name. So we need to do more. If anything great happens to this lady, it seems like greatness that happened to Nigeria and also Africa at large. So we need to do more. You, you should see um, when at least talk about the kind of support they get and how it takes them to cross the line. That is what we're talking about. Now in your head, when you feel all of those support, you're poised to do more. You're poised to, to want to give more. Yeah. It feels like you're looking behind you and you're seeing a massive crowd, you know, right there. Uh, who's got voices? Yes, we, a lot of persons love her, but they don't have voices that can reach out to her. But for those administrators, you know, uh, you know the uh, big boys, corporate world and all of that, who can reach out, get to reach out to her, and then she understands directly how this love and support is. And trust me, the only thing Toby Loba will wake up to every day is the fact that she needs to break, uh, she needs to do, uh, you know, good for these people uh, to have smiles on their right. faces. It's as simple as that. Love yeah. her so much, but it's beyond just saying we love her. We need to show it by supporting her. All right, all right. So uh, that's it. Whatever that translates to uh, ensuring that she gets the support and just to ensure that she continues this trailblazing performance through uh, to the Olympics. All right, let's go to someone else who, of course, has been making us proud uh, in recent years. and. Um, also did well in Hungary. Somebody else has spoken to uh, quite a few number of times. Uh, Esse Brume uh, did well. Um, also, I'm going to come to you. This is another story that Gladys they had. Uh, of course, uh, she put up a performance, came in second, but of course, she's always in there with a shout. Uh, oh, definitely, and you know, and, and she's a she's a global force in the long jump events. She's also a good prospect for the 2026, you know, come the 2024 Olympics in Paris. Good friend to Toby Loba and, you know, they both share the same philosophy as regards winning. But today in Hungary, in Adegula is one memorial meet. She was only able to finish second and no pressure for Toby, uh, for 
Essa Brume, because lately she's trying to rediscover herself. Remember, at the just concluded national trials in Lagos, she was competing in the sprint event, you know, and that's because she's she's trying to see ways that she can evolve. So sometimes that drift can affect your performance. But all day, every day, Essa Brume is a champ when you talk about women's long jump. Worldwide, she's respected. But today, she was able to jump 6.69 meters, you know, and that was just uh, good enough to give her uh, a silver to second place finish. She finished behind Serbia's uh, Gadasevic, who won the event with 6.80 meters. As you can see, not so far away, she's going to, you know, get the dust off her shoulder, pick herself back up, and try to consolidate on this performance. I was trying to reach Coach Yahaya to try to understand some of the things that might have gone wrong today, because for these mates, come on, easy peasy. We say, say, Brume just jumped to victory. Uh, but take nothing out of this uh, second place finish. It's not a bad jump. And I believe that she'll keep getting better and better. All right. Uh, I mean, that, that's the hope. That's his desire. Um, Idris, just, we, we, have, we have quite a lot of things we want to talk yeah. about. But I, I'm very sure you want to say something about Essay. That's yeah. another athlete mm -hmm. that a lot of effort has to put into conditioning and ensuring that this kind of performances continue to happen when it matters. I think we don't understand what this lady gets to put in uh, before they can show this to the entire world on, uh, you know, race day or jump day as it stands, talking about long jump. She, she's massive. She's global. Uh, she, she's getting respect everywhere. And I think the only place she doesn't get the kind of respect that she should get is back home. I don't think we respect Se Brume enough. Probably she doesn't do the flashy sports that we know, basketball, football, then even in athletics, she's not doing the tracks. It's a brumette jumps, and she jumps beautifully. She jumps, you know, uh, 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 hugely where, you know, everybody gets to talk about her, except for this part, which is her country. And I think uh, we need to understand that and give her the kind of accolade she should get. Right. And then for Toby, we talked about, and also it's a brumette. One thing that amazes me is the kind of humility that comes with the achievement. I think at this level, they should, you know, be exhuming some pride. But no, you get to meet them, and you see that they are hungry for more, so it keeps them in check. And I love that. I love that as well. All right, let me give the floor to Austin now and uh, talk about uh, para um, badminton. Uh, he, was, he was so eager uh, to talk about it um, the other time. Uh, I mean, as you can see uh, from the screen, Nigeria winning eight gold medals in Kampala, uh, Uganda. I mean, Austin will take us right through uh, those stories and very exciting times uh, for Nigeria. I love it, you know, particularly anything para sports right here at Channel Sports. We always support them because uh, we love the inspiring and motivational stories that come out of these para athletes. And Nigeria has been dominating para badminton in Africa for some time. And they did just that uh, at the 30, at the para, all Africa para badminton championships in Kampala, uh, Uganda. They won 13 medals. I'll break it down. Eight gold two silver and three bronze medals. So beautiful because uh, we get to talk about the able-bodied athletes all the time and nobody gets to, you know, commend these special athletes, particularly those ones who have always been uh, representing the country and dominating in a particular sport. And that's what we have been doing with para badminton. I love this story so much because it will motivate the Federation to do much more for para badminton in Nigeria find ways to, you know, pump up more support for the para badminton players we have in Nigeria and then find more competitions for them to compete in. Not just competitions, also put together programs uh, that will encourage and motivate these para badminton players to do more. Ken Davis, do you agree? I totally agree. I, uh, I, I think uh, some years ago, uh, some, uh, you know, set of, uh, you know, uh, administrators came in, came on board talking about bad meeting, and they changed everything. I can remember, you know, starting that year, and they said the first thing is to go to schools, get mm. students, you know, from their primary and uh, early secondary school, not even the senior secondary school, junior secondary school, to turn their, uh, you know, uh, interest towards the, uh, you know, bad meeting. And if you start that maybe some seven years ago, do you know that if you were talking to a 10-year-old then, 
that 10 year old will be 17 years old now because it started seven years ago and that is what it is it feels like uh, just go for the champions now but you started from little and then you help them grow into champions and then what happened with table tennis talking about in it all show this happening with badminton where the players have a direct love for the administrators because they nurtured them right from that point yeah. up, 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 up street and then talking about the para athlete two things para athlete look like they just want to win to make a statement and the statement is the fact that we want to be happy for what we do we love that and we need we need we need to respect them more for that and then number two bad meeting is doing something great and i think right now it should be one of those sports that should be taking the front row well done the para athletes really uh, <laughs> i'm hope I'm, I'm wishing that there is better way uh, you know to acknowledge what they've done all right um that's what we're wishing for, and hopefully they get the accolades they deserve and the support. Earlier on, Austin, we were switching uh, to um, some other uh, sports stories. Earlier on, Austin uh, mentioned the 2026 Commonwealth Games, uh, talking about it being in jeopardy, and the reason is very simple. Australia City of Victoria has withdrawn uh, from hosting the 2026 Commonwealth Games, citing cost overruns. Uh, Victoria's withdrawal places the future of the uh, Quadrennial Games under doubt given the challenge of finding replacements host uh, three years out from uh, the event. We knew how difficult it was for uh, Tokyo uh, when they were going to host uh, the, the, the Olympics. I mean, the cost turned out to be six times more than the original budget uh, and so uh, this explains the reason but let's quickly listen to the key stakeholders explain their reason for the withdrawal we'll come back for more sports tonight what's become clear uh, is that the cost of hosting these games in 2026 is not the 2.6 billion dollars which was budgeted and allocated and is sitting uh, vast vast majority of which has not been spent uh, it's not $2.6 billion, it is in fact at least $6 billion uh, and could be as high as $7 billion. And I cannot stand here and say to you that I have any confidence that that even $7 billion number would appropriately and adequately fund these games. Uh, but we've looked at Melbourne, we've looked at less sports, we've looked at less hubs, we've looked at every conceivable option. All of them are far in excess of the $2.6 billion that's been budgeted. So all of them represent more cost than there is benefit. And on that basis, none of those options stack up and we're not going to be hosting the games in 2026. All right, simply put, uh, the costs far outweigh the benefits in any scenario. Uh, that's uh, what is coming out of from the Australia's Australia city of Victoria, explaining reasons why, the key stakeholders explaining the reason why they're not going to be hosting the 2026 Commonwealth Games. All right, let's talk about uh, the biggest sporting event of the year and it's upon us, uh, the FIFA Women's World Cup. And there you have it, two days to go. We've waited for a long time, but it is upon us two days to go uh, to uh, the FIFA Women's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, Kenny Davis, I'm, I'm going to come to you. Are you feeling it? Are you feeling um, the vibe with two days to go to uh, the tournament? Everybody's talking about it. Everybody seems to be quite excited. Uh, um, um, uh, the fever has already gone around, uh, you know, high included, uh, you know, caught in the mix. Uh, I think proper publicity, uh, I don't know, maybe because this is the present, it feels like this is the most anticipated women's walk up it ever. Is. Yes, because I'm, I'm going by, you know, for every time you're in the present, it feels like this is the best thing yet. So uh, I, I think the, the, the paparazzi, the, uh, a whole lot comes with this, and I'm waiting for the football to start, and I hope it matches everything that's, uh, you know, happened in the build up to the tournament. But, but I also have interest in the Women's World Cup because I'm a Nigerian and we have representatives. And I think that is where, you know, I might just not, uh, you know, be so happy okay. for the World Cup to All start. Right. All right. But trust me, I can't wait for the debutants, for, uh, you know, the regulars like Germany, Brazil and all of okay. that. You know, several champions, you know, 
for the group's you know what, teams. Let, let's allow Austin chip in okay. before we go on the break. I'll yield the floor to him now. Uh, Austin, from 10 days be before now, you've been saying you've been feeling the vibes, and now it's two days to go. Um, how does it feel? Gets on social media, one way or the other, um, the FIFA Women's World Cup is gaining some traction, some interaction, and I love it so much. Even the talks about the money, the projections, and how it will be dispersed, still getting some talking points. Our countries are beginning to get into Australia and New Zealand. The Super Falcons, they've settled down in Brisbane, Australia. You know what? We will go on a quick break. When we come back, we'll listen to Coach Randy Wardrum. I'm glad that this time around, he's focused talking about the Super Falcons and not the NFL. We'll hear from him when we come back. Don't go anywhere. Hey. Welcome back, Sports Tonight on Channels Television. We're counting down to the start of the 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup that will take place in Australia and New Zealand. The Super Falcons, uh, Africa's uh, top representative, I was close to saying Africa's champions. That has changed. Africa's close representatives, they've touched down in Brisbane, Australia, getting ready for their opening match against Canada. And Coach Randy Wardrum has been giving his views. Let's listen to him. Yes. Good. Hand. Don't call my. How was it like? Good. A good good session. Uh, a good day that we could load them a little bit. Um, the players were into it. It was it was uh, intense. Uh, and then we got a chance to work on some of the tactics at the end with the full 11 v 11. So very very pleased with training today. Well, obviously the weather is going to be a little bit of a factor. It's going to be much colder there than it is here. It's obviously winter in Australia. Um, so, you know, we're just going to have to adapt to it. It's a 12.30 kickoff midday game. Uh, so that should help a little bit with the weather. And I think the thing is, you get to this point, you just have to play in the elements, what you know, whatever they are. You, you, uh, you had a World Cup, so our players will just mentally have to be ready to, to play for that. But I think the players are, are prepared. I think they understand our game plan. And uh, now we just have to make sure we execute it. Well, I, I've said this every time we've done an interview, is, is pressure is always there. As a manager of a, a team, <clears throat> there's pressure. Uh, there's pressure from the players. You know, they feel the pressure too. Um, and we have to learn to cope with that and manage that so we can go into the match with a clear head and not have things weighing us down so we can play freely and the way we want our team to play. We don't want them uptight and because of the pressure. And so as a manager, it's my job to not to display too much pressure in front of the team uh, so they can go out and do what they need to do. Very, I mean, obviously, the Olympic gold medalists, uh, we know they're going to be very good. We played them twice in the last year. Um, obviously, a lot of respect. It's a very good side. They're very well coached. But I think we'll have the ability to, uh, to be successful if we perform uh, and stick to our game plan. Yeah, very important. No pressure. Are getting to the game with a clear head, keep the focus and see how they can upset Canada. And um, Kane Idris, that's very, very important. If you can win your first match in a major tournament such as the World Cup, then that's huge pressure off your back. Yes, um, that's huge. Uh, he said for the manager, there is always pressure, but that is what managers do help the team get a soft landing. So you soak up all of the pressure for the team to be freed up. And um, I, I think that's a fantastic idea. He talked about the timing and all. But there is something murky happening right now because Canada also are having something like a, a semblance of a house in disarray because, um, you know, the Federation is talking about not so much of, um, you know, funds, uh, equal pay. The ladies are talking about that. They said, look at our achievements and all of that. And I think in the midst of all of this discussion, maybe... Because if you're going by the papers, by the books, I think Canada is far better, it seems, than Nigeria. No disrespect to the Super Falcons. So maybe with all of this happening, you know, playing under the skin, we can just come from behind and then, uh, you know, get all three points. And like Austin said, I think that would be massive. Beat Canada in that group, get all three points. I think all other teams will be in shivers. And if that happens, not just you getting three points to start your competition, you're also helping yourself in both games that you've not played because these opponents would already, you know, have themselves defeated 50% because they will look at the game. Nigeria beat Canada. 
then who are we? So I think that would be a fantastic start for Nigeria if it happens. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, but just, um, just to note, it appears that all of the teams seem to be having issues with mm. bonuses and pay. Um, I don't know, maybe the FIFA money is getting it's a lot of these teams <laughs> distracted, uh, but we'll see. Uh, let's talk about the co-host now, Australia. Uh, of course, uh, they're talking about being ready for the tournament. Not just ready to host, but ready to do well and go far in the tournament. Let's listen to uh, some players from the Matildas. That's what they're called. We'll come back for more on Sports Tonight. My takeaway from what she told us was that we know who we are. We know why we do this. And whilst we want to perform and give results for others outside the circle, at the end of the day, you believe in yourself and you do it for yourself. Like All athletes do what they do because they love the sport. And so to not lose track of that and, and that gives you the confidence to go out there and do your job. Not too much on social media right now, so I'm keeping away from it. But, um, you know, just from talks with, with girls as it is, doing what we do, um, of course it would be great for all of us, you know, to be paid equal prize money as the men. I think we're a little bit of a ways off it, but... Um, Definitely be nice to see. We've always been very focused on ourselves and trying to keep out the outside noise, so there's no difference right now. Um, if anything, it's more so in that regard. And we know that the country is behind us. Um, our fans are amazing, and we're just trying to take uh, those parts of the hype um, and then just shutting out the rest of it. All right, so uh, some of the players uh, from uh, Australia are talking about being ready. Uh, but then again, we had the laughing in the studio, Kennedy Idris pointing out that of all the teams, one way or the other, this pay issue always, always coming up. Uh, we'll see what happens um, as we uh, go on. Uh, Kennedy Idris, before we take a look at Group F uh, and G, do, do you fancy the, chance, the chances of the Matildas? To an extent, they have some care. <laughs> I think she's not going to be the only one to play. <laughs> exactly. But there are sometimes you just need those X factor in your team. She's well exposed, vast experienced. Um, she's a fantastic player. And I think they would count on her exploit, you know, uh, to take them across the line. It's like Nigeria looking in the way of Aziza Toshuala. There is no way you would always look in the, in the way of your X factor. So I think I fancy them. Then there is something about Austin. If you're 50% good a team, and then you're hosting. That takes you to about 70, 75%. So because you have your supporters behind you every time you play. So that means that the Australian team, that's for me, they are more than 50% good. Okay. And they have their fans behind them. All so right. I think they are wanting to look, to look, uh, to look forward to All this right. competition. Uh, so uh, with two days to go, let's continue uh, with our countdown as we take a look at Group F and, uh, of course, Group G. I just go up to the screen now uh, to to uh, take a look at what you have uh, in those groups. But uh, very interesting. Uh, so very interesting to take a look at Group F, for instance, has, uh, of course, Brazil's uh, Celeste, uh, that's what they're called, the ladies, Le Bleu, France. And, of course, you have <laughs> Jamaica and uh, Panama. Uh, interesting names. Let's also look at Group F so that we just, uh, I mean Group G, uh, so that we just uh, don't go through this uh, again. Argentina, not, not really known much for uh, female uh, yeah. football. Uh, the Italians, South Africa, and Sweden. Uh, not just because I'm an African, I think the Bayana Bayana are on the rise. Mm. It, it must be said. Mm. Um, I mean, coming from a Nigerian is, is hard to take, <laughs> but that's the truth. That is true. Bayana Bayana on the rise, and it, we must acknowledge um, that they are. All right. Um, I mean, let, let me hear Austin's thoughts. Um, let me allow you to take it from here, Austin. Uh, group F, Group G. Uh, uh, African sisters, Banyana, Banyana, how far do you think they can go? But I like the fact that um, the Banyana, Banyanas, uh, every, every time they, they get an opportunity to play, they show that they can fight. Um, they are Africa's champions. I think that is enough motivation to take into this competition, except for another money issue that would have even, you know, 
uh, put some dents on their mentality and preparation. They were able to finally cure that and take it away. But it's a very tricky group, that group that's got Argentina, Italy, and Sweden. And if you take a look at it, Argentina isn't so big with women's football. Yeah. But because of the region and the things that they've done, it can rub off, you know? Argentina, I think they're ranked 26th in the world, uh, 28th in the world with women's football. Uh, that's not really massive. But Italy and Sweden. Sweden is ranked third in the world. The Italians are 16th in the world ranking, you know? Um, on paper and the rankings, they're all better than South Africa. But we know football doesn't work with the rankings anymore. And South Africa will take their chances uh, when they open up right there at the World Cup. So, uh, same with the Super Falcons. If they can win their first game, it will push their momentum, you know, to see what they can do uh, going further in the competition. But I'm not, I'm not writing them off. No way am I writing them off. In fact, I'm, I'm putting the underdog tags on South Africa uh, to be able to do one or two things. And if you take a look at uh, the group that's got Brazil, France, Jamaica, and Panama, come on, it's straightforward football right there. It's between Brazil and France. If anything else happens, just give it to football. But right straightforward, it's Brazil and France uh, in that group. And I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, South Africa can do to get out of that group. And for Brazil, this World Cup means so much for them. It, it's just difficult to talk about Brazil and the Women's World Cup and then keep saying that they have never won it. They are yeah. ranked eighth in the world with women's football. And I'm sure that that ugly description, they would really want to take it out of them, you know, because... Uh, it's really disturbing with everything that Brazil has done, uh, particularly for women's football, that they, they haven't won the World Cup before. But hey, that's what it is. All right, that's what it is. Um, Kennedy Idris, uh, taking it from where Austin just dropped it off, it's part of the popularity of the sport in Brazil. Sometimes it's hard to imagine yeah. that the Celeste have not won the World Cup at it all. Is, it's hard to imagine, and not just the popularity of the sport in Brazil what they've done in women's football. I think, you know, World Cup, Olympics and all, the women have, have uh, you know, been very outstanding. But sometimes, like we say, you just need a little bit of luck on your side when it comes to football. And that's, I, I think that's the only thing left. I think they'll play another good competition. It's just waiting for that luck to, to, to shine upon them. And uh, like Austin said, I think France and Brazil is a straightforward thing straightforward. in that group. And we'll wait to see what Jamaica and Panama. But, you know, stories flying around that the Jamaica and the reggae girls, you know, might just, you know, uh, have shockers. Because I was following all of the debutants. The way they qualified for the World Cup, trust me, Yemi, we need to have our eyes on it. But someone will be quick to remind me that there are still minors in football. Okay. And right. then you go to Group G, where you yes. have... Yes, the, the Swedes. Yes. Say some years back. Yeah. Dreaded. <laughs> They're still there, Dead. but... but not as feared as yeah. they used to be. And, and hopefully this is not the time they will. Because, see, uh, Africans have nine representatives. We want our representatives to perform well. And we have an African champion in there, in South Africa. Trust me, as much as you said, it's hard to say South Africa on the rise. And I think if Sweden turns up, Italy is good. Argentina is good. South Africa might not have a space. This should not be the competition, they would rise back. Because there is something about big teams or great teams. They would have a time where they would, you know, uh, plunge down. It will be uh, a, a dark time. And then a competition will spur them back to their excellence. And I, I, I'm seeing Sweden in that light as much as I don't want to. And right. for the Italians, I think they are one of those teams that... Uh, it is at that time where we look away from them, they will shock the whole world. For Argentina, they said... We want to stay out of the shadow land of Messi and the Argentine okay. boys All within right. the World Cup. All we right. want to do our, want to have our own feet. Even though they're not really known for <laughs> Even they're not really known. All right, uh, let's move on. Uh, we have just a few minutes before uh, we wrap things up uh, on the show. Let's talk about Lionel Messi. Katie has mentioned it, so we go there. Uh, and of course, Lionel Messi, uh, of course, taking part in his first training session with Inter Miami. Some people have started joking that Inter Miami might just become Barcelona B. I mean, who knows? Uh, we heard Jordi Alba is on his way uh, to uh, Inter Miami. He currently has Sergio Busquets, currently has Lionel Messi. So we'll see what happens. Uh, Kennedy Idris, a lot of people focusing on Lionel Messi. But Tata Martino asked all them, 
you need to give this man some time. Yeah, yeah. You need to understand this is not prime Messi. This is Messi winding down his career. But you're, you're, um, you're a victim of your standards. Trust me, if I get on the football pitch in Inter Miami, I'll just be looked at <laughs> like one of them. But this is Lionel Messi. Messi, Ronaldo should never be annoyed at the kind of expectation people have of them. You've given us this to taste, and we want more of it. So, by their exceptional yeah, high standards. High standards, they are the being goals, judged the assists, by their assists, you know, yeah. what they do on the All pitch, right. I think it's crazy. And for Lionel Messi, what you did at the 2022 World Cup still lives, okay. you know, rightly in our hearts. So, we right. want to see you replicate. I want to see you replicate. All right, let me give the floor to Austin now as we just go to his backyard and talk about uh, Arsenal. And, uh, of course, the Arsenal manager saying he's pleased. I don't know if the fans are pleased, but. He says he's pleased with what the club have done so far. I'm not sure the fans agree, but well. <laughs> well, I mean, the fans right here in England, um, from what I've seen and heard on local media, they seem to be pleased. You know, look, this is football. These days, for you to win trophies, you need to put, you know, your money where your mouth is, you know. And they've signed Kayavas, they've signed uh, Jurian Timba, and then a record-breaking signing of Declan Rice. You know, that shows you a team that really wants to win. And again, again, Mikel Arteta isn't losing his major players. And that's what uh, the fans, you know, are, are talking about. They like it as they're consolidating, is strengthening the team. And then right now, it's just to find a way that all of them can blend. Don't forget, he also has trust Sad, who is still trying to get into this team. So, yes, I don't know if the Arsenal fans in Nigeria... But the ones in England, they seem to like the fact that their club is spending and showing some level of ambition. Let's listen to Mikel Arteta. That's the man that matters. And he's pleased with the transfer so far at Arsenal. You can imagine to, uh, we signed the players that we wanted. Um, we signed them early, and uh, they seem to they start to adapt to the team really fast. And, and we have some time now to prepare and for them as well to, to gain the best chance to express themselves the right way. And to that, obviously, they need to experience a few days uh, how it looks like ours. I think every signing that we've made brings a very special thing to the team. Obviously, Declan is very much known in the league and he's done tremendously well both for West Ham and, and the England national team. And uh, yeah, he's a team that's going to bring a lot of qualities, a lot of leadership, a lot of experience in the league, uh, very specific in the position with the qualities that he has. So we are delighted to have him. agree, you know, I mean, that's the man uh, that we work with these new signings. That's the man uh, that will bring the philosophy, the ambition, what he sees in these players into fruition. So not taking a swipe at you guys that are fans, but if Mikel Arteta is pleased, please, the fans should also be pleased. I think that's all from me in London. I'm asking Okonakwan in everything you do. Remember, keep talking sports. Bye for now. All right. Uh, jury is out on whether the fans are pleased or not, but we'll take that for another day. Kenny Davis, I want to thank you for your time on the show today. We'll do this again some other time. Of course, we'll do it some other time. My house now fan, I'm pleased too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, that's the show. We hope you enjoyed everything we've been able to bring to you. We'll do this again tomorrow. I'm Emma Adebayo. Bye-bye.